welcome to Mauna Lua Past, Present, and Future. My name is Luca Nichols Alfas, and today we'll be continuing our talk about the Hawaiian honey creepers and their plight. Last time we spoke with Josh Atwood from DLNR and learned why the honey creepers are so special and how avian malaria spread by invasive mosquitoes are pushing them to the precipice of extinction. My guest today is Mamo Waia, sorry, Mamo Waianuhea. And we are both conservations working to protect our native Manu for future generations. Um, Mamo is a graduate student in the zoology department at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where she studies mosquitoes in Dr. Matthew Medeiros' lab. Uh, she is of native Hawaiian descent and mixed settler ancestry and was raised in the dis diaspora, namely in Oregon on Kalapuya lands. Did I say that correctly? <laughs> okay. Um, her love for our native Manu and the desire to protect them for future generations led her to study mosquitoes. Mamo is passionate about restoring Aina from Maoka to Makai and connecting people to place. Thank you so much for joining me today, Mamo. Yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> um, before we kind of jump into mosquitoes and Mubaki, which is our focus, I kind of want to ask, you know, what is your why? Why is it that you do what you do? Um, so to me, our native Hawaiian honey creepers um, are kupuna, um, and that I would consider them elders, ancestors, um, beings that I have tremendous respect for. Um, I would consider them sacred, and I think that overall we just have a lot to learn from them. They're very um, wise in the way that they they know um, their homes, their forests um, better than we do, and so. Um, there's a lot that we can learn from them, and they deserve to be here. Um, and another reason why I love them <laughs> is because um, they're super important in Native Hawaiian culture. Mm -hmm. um, they have been used to make uh, chiefly implements such as ahuula, our feathered capes, and mahi ole, our feathered helmets. Um, they're also present in our mele, oli, and ka'au which are our songs, chants, and stories. Um, so I think that just speaks to how tremendously important um, our birds are. Um, in addition to this cultural importance, they're also extremely uh, important pollinators for our native forest. Um, and of course, a healthy native forest um, helps capture the clouds and the rain that eventually trickles through all the rocks. Um, and goes through the aquifer and becomes the water that we drink. So um, really, they're a super important piece of this puzzle um, of the ecosystem that we have that um, keeps Hawaii healthy and us healthy. Yeah, and so mosquitoes, malaria, and birds, how did those interests and stuff intersect? Yeah, so unfortunately, our native Hawaiian honey creepers, um, many of them are threatened and endangered um, that is, they're at risk of extinction. Um, and this is for many reasons, but um, recent, uh, more recent research has shown that avian malaria, which is a disease that's spread by non-native mosquitoes, is uh, the issue that is, uh, or the pressing issue that is um, potentially causing extinction very soon. Um, and of course, we don't want that ha to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so my love for honey creepers really has uh, driven my interest in mosquitoes and how to prevent extinction of our native birds. I see. So not only to like protect them and keep them um, around, but you know to bring them into abundance again, and then hopefully you know have an EEV or something you know in our backyards. Because from what we've spoken before, you know these birds. We're seen, you know, from the tops of the mountains to the seashore, and so you know they're regulated to these tiny forests up in the mountain because of you know mosquitoes and things. And so, you've been working in mosquito and um, malaria uh, or Wolvakia, not malaria, but Wolvakia research too. And I wanted to ask you, like, what some of the conservation tools that are being um, considered for um, suppressing mosquitoes and controlling them? Um, yeah, so. This is a great question. Um, when we talk about, you know, how important the honey creepers are, that's the next question. Is like, what are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. um, and so people are, the public is usually asking, you know, do we have a vaccine? And so um, that would be awesome, but unfortunately, a vaccine doesn't exist. Um, so maybe that's a future option, but that would require 
potentially capturing all the birds so that we could vaccinate them. Oh, wow, that's hard. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that that's kind of off the table right now as an option. Um, translocation of our birds to a malaria-free zone in Hawaii is mm -hmm. another um, option that's being pursued. Uh, it's gonna take a while to figure out where those safe places are. And unfortunately, we don't necessarily know right now how long those places will be uh, protected from avian malaria. So that's another obstacle to that potential solution. Um, something that's happening right now is the captive rearing of several of our honeycreeper species uh, with the intention of re-releasing them into the wild. Um, and so that comes with its own challenges. Um, it turns out it's pretty challenging to reintroduce these honeycreeper species once they've been um, bred in captivity. So um, that comes with challenges. And um, I guess the, uh, the final solution that I want to talk about, or potential solution that I want to talk about, is um, landscape scale mosquito control. And so that would involve um, a method to reduce the number of mosquitoes that are on the landscape that could potentially spread avian malaria to our birds. Um, and so you mentioned Wolbachia, mm -hmm. and um, Wolbachia Integrated Insect Technique, or Wolbachia IIT, is one method of landscape scale mosquito control that is being considered. Awesome, so Josh, and, Josh Atlet and I actually talked briefly about, um, we called it the incompatible insect technique, but also integrated um, insect. So I couldn't, could you repeat that last one again? You didn't use IIT the way I did, and I was just oh, like, okay. oh, interested to hear. <laughs> um, but the, to design and implement this tool, um, Birds Not Mosquito you know, really needs to know about the biology of the two key players, the mosquitoes and the Wolbachia. And I just, um, with your um, knowledge and things, if you could share your mana'o on the mosquitoes. Yeah, so um, in designing any kind of program to uh, control mosquitoes at the landscape scale, it's important to know a little bit about mosquito biology. Um, and so something about mosquitoes is that they go through a complete metamorphosis during their life cycle. Um, the Culex mosquitoes that spread avian malaria um, actually lay eggs in these raft-like structures. So it's okay. a bunch of eggs that are stuck together and they get laid on top of water. Um, from those eggs, larvae hatch and they live in the water. They eat um, detritus or like uh, leaf debris. Oh and then they continue to grow and eat and grow. <laughs> and then they turn into pupa, um, and the adult mosquitoes emerge from the pupa and become uh, an adult that is flying around and uh, is the mosquito that we're more familiar with. Um, about how long does um, it take to go from like an egg to adult mosquito? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it takes about one to two weeks. It kind of depends on the conditions and the temperature. Um, and I think some other good things to know about mosquitoes is that, um, especially with Culex, those egg rafts can contain from like 200 to 300 oh. eggs potentially. So, and that's all from one female mosquito. So you can kind of imagine how fast the mosquito population can grow when one mosquito can create, or I guess two mosquitoes can create, you know, 300. I see. Um, I see. Yeah. And so um, I know there are some differences between a male mosquito and a female mosquito, especially in like where they find their sustenance. And I wanted to know if you could touch a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, I forgot to mention that earlier, but um, Something interesting about mosquitoes is that um, the females are actually the only ones that bite and draw blood. Um, and they need that blood uh, because they need the protein to create the eggs mm -hmm. um, that they're laying. And um, so yeah, when we think of mosquitoes, we think of them biting us. And really it's only female mosquitoes biting us. Um, male mosquitoes do not bite. Um, they're actually pollinators, so they drink nectar. Um, but something important to know is that uh, there aren't any native species of mosquitoes in Hawaii, so um, originally they didn't, they don't play any uh, significant role in our native ecosystem. Um, yeah. So, 
um, my understanding is that they were introduced about like the 1826, so about 200 years ago or so. So that wasn't enough time for anything to become dependent yeah. on mosquitoes. Yeah, so our, you know, our native bat, our old pe'opea, is not reliant on mosquitoes. Um, yeah, okay. they're a recent introduction, <laughs> more recent, I guess. I see. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, I've, as a fellow bird lover, I have dove into the mosquito world, and I didn't think I would learn so much about mosquitoes. You know, they've always just been a pest species to me, and something that like annoys you when you go outside and you want to enjoy the backyard at five o'clock in the afternoon, but you can't. Um, but um, it's great to hear that you know there's a tool to help us control mosquitoes and suppress mosquitoes. And I know that there is another player that's really important in the incompatible insect technique, and you said their name in the beginning, and that's a bacterium called Wolbachia. And could you share your mana'o on that bacterium? Yeah, so Wolbachia is an endosymbiotic bacteria, um, which just means that it's a bacteria that actually lives inside the cells of other insects okay. or invertebrates. Um, and so Wolbachia is a genus of bacteria that is actually very common in many different kinds of invertebrates around the world. I've seen statistics from like 40 to 70 percent of wow. all invertebrate species. So it's a really widespread genus of um, bacteria and um, they're very specific to each species that they um, are a symbiont with. Um, many mosquito species have Wolbachia and the species of mosquito that spreads avian malaria, which is Culex quinquefasciatus, um, they carry Wolbachia naturally. So they're just one of the many. <laughs> okay. So um, you were saying that Wolbachia um, is maternally inherited. So that means that it only travels from mom to offspring and so forth? Yeah, exactly. So um, just as you said, uh, baby mosquito gets its um, Wolbachia from its mother. Um, they don't get it from their father. It comes uh, maternally. Okay. And so do you mind telling a little bit more about how this bacterium and um, its interactions with the mosquito thus then equals to, you know, mosquito suppression in, the, um, in our forests? Yeah, so um, I think I mentioned before that um, Many different species of mosquitoes have Wolbachia naturally. And so um, it's been observed in nature that um, depending on the Wolbachia strain that uh, these populations of mosquitoes have, if two populations have different Wolbachia status, mm -hmm. um, they'll mate, but they cannot produce fertile offspring. Okay. And so this is called cytoplasmic incompatibility. Um, and the cytoplasmic part is uh, just from the fact that Wolbachia lives in the cytoplasm of the mosquito cell, which is just the inside of the mosquito cell. Um, but the main point is that um, two populations of mosquitoes with different Wolbachia strains uh, will mate, but they cannot produce feral offspring. And um, so this natural phenomenon uh, has been uh, sort of taken and uh, innovated upon and uh, integrated into this Wolbachia IIT technique. Um, and so, yeah. Awesome. No, that really <laughs> helps. So um, a lot of what we're doing now, um, at least in the birds, not mosquitoes realm, is you know identifying the Wolbachia that is currently in mosquitoes in Hawaii, and then um, identifying a strain that is incompatible with that mosquito. And so given the samples that you've done, um, how prevalent would you say Wolbachia is in the southern house mosquito, the common name for Culex quinquefasciatus, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I've done uh, some sampling of mosquitoes in Hawaii, and uh, all the samples that I've looked at have had Wolbachia, okay. um, and the scientific literature uh, points to Culex quinquefasciatus having uh, oh. Wolbachia. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Mosquitoes, Wolbachia, something we have had since just an estimate, at least when mosquitoes were first introduced like 200 years ago. So these um, players have already been on the landscapes here in Hawaii since then at least for yeah. mosquitoes. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a pretty tight evolutionary uh, relationship. So um, Culex, because Culex are not native to Hawaii, they, um, 
came from other places around the world. But even in other places around the world, uh, Culex have Wolbachia. Okay. Um, just um, another concern that has come up, and you know, just wanted to talk about it is, you said that Wolbachia is only found in um, insects and or arthropods and things. Can I get Wolbachia, or can the birds get Wolbachia? Um, so no, <laughs> which is great news. You know, um, Wolbachia it, uh, is um, symbiotic with the mosquito, which just means it has a really um, tight relationship. Okay. Uh, it has to live inside of the cell of the mosquito. And so if the Wolbachia gets out of the side of the cell of the mosquito, um, it does not live very long and it cannot reproduce. So um, there isn't any risk of, you know, if you get bit or you wouldn't get bit um, by, or I guess you are getting bit by mosquitoes <laughs> that have Wolbachia because um, the mosquitoes here already have Wolbachia. But yeah, you won't get Wolbachia from getting bitten by a mosquito, your pets won't get Wolbachia. Okay. Yeah. So, th so just to clarify, the, the cytoplasm is the like jelly substance that's inside of your cell. So they just yeah. kind of live in there and that's where they are inside the mosquitoes. Yeah, that's where they live and <laughs> hang out, <laughs> their place. Okay, um, as we kind of, you know, go up, like I know that you are learning about mosquitoes and Wolbachia, is there anything like a cool or anything that's very interesting about that, um, your study subjects that, you know, like you would like to share? Um, I guess I would say that I, I don't study Wolbachia specifically, but mm -hmm. I kind of study like the entire, my goal is to study the entire microbiome, mm -hmm. which is the, you know, all the bacteria, fungi, viruses, the things that live inside the mosquito. Oh, um, <laughs> which Wolbachia is a major player. Um, I would just say that um, Wolbachia and other endosymbionts are the, you know, the players that live inside of the mosquito. Um, they're very interesting. It's like a whole little world in there. Um, and I think uh, the potential, or the use of them for uh, mosquito Wolbachia IIT mm -hmm. um, is, you know, the best option that we have available right now to um, save our Hawaiian honey creepers. So, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> like a whole nother world inside of an already tiny little organism. Yeah, that's it's amazing. Amazing. Um, before we kind of like wrap up and talk about, you know, what the general public can do, I just wanted to ask, you know. We're talking about Wolbachia and mosquitoes, but it's really for the honey creepers. And do you have any like moments or special t um, relationships that you want to share with the honey creepers? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, my name is Mamo. Uh, I wasn't specifically named after the Mamo bird, mm -hmm. um, which is a unfortunately extinct species of native Hawaiian honey creeper, um, but it is like one meaning of my name. And so I guess uh, I always have that sort of in the back of my mind. Um, I, I love our honey creepers. I've been really privileged to um, work with them in the past, uh, been able to see them just living their life in the forest, oh, which is awesome. the most beautiful thing. Um, my, my biggest hope is that everybody in Hawaii can do that someday. And mm -hmm. so in order for that to happen, of course, our birds need to be around. Yeah. Um, they need to be living and um, yeah. I think that's that's most important. Um, do you know of any places on Oahu that um, people can go out to to try and take a glimpse at a honey creeper since they're not in our backyards anymore? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I know that you can sometimes see uh, Amakihi and I think also Apapane at um, Lion Arboretum oh, in really? Manoa. Yeah. Wow. Um, I think a lot of the ridge hikes uh, you can also see Amakihi and Apapane. Um, those are kind of our uh, currently least threatened honey creepers. Um, that doesn't mean that they're any less exciting to see. <laughs> they're so much fun to watch and you can really learn a lot just from watching them. Yeah, I really love hearing the sound of the amakihi. It just reminds me of someone just like sighing at you and it brings up, um, they also look a little like they're judging you a little bit yeah. out of all <laughs> the honey creeper faces you got that, that I've mask. seen. Yeah. <laughs> um, so kind of as we wrap up, you know, what are some things that the community can do to um, help out with the efforts to, you know, 
protect our Hawaiian honey creepers for us today and you know for future generations to be able to continue having a relationship with them? Yeah, that's such an important question. Um, I would say that to start, um, it's really important to like build your pilina or your uh, relationship, your connection to our birds if you're not super familiar with them yet. Um, I know it can kind of be challenging to see them in person, but if you can get out there and do that, um, it will really help you to uh, feel connected to them, mm -hmm. which I think is important. Um, of course, online there's, uh, you know, you can find photos of them, videos. Um, there's, there's resources out there. I know that um, Birds Not Mosquitoes, which is a project that's uh, currently coordinating uh, landscape scale mosquito suppression in Hawaii, um, has some really great information about our birds and mm -hmm. also Wabaki IIT. So um, that's a great place to go for education if you want to learn more. Um, I think uh, spreading information about uh, our birds and also uh, mosquito suppression is important, so, uh, and I think the best way for people to do that is to like talk to their friends and family. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome, so um, one of the sources we were saying that they could go like www.birds.mosquitoes.org to learn more about the technique and the plan to um, suppress mosquitoes, but I also know that like Maui Forest Birds Recovery Project and Koi Forest Birds Recovery Project have some really great resources. And I think um, even if you went to the DLNR um, website, they have audio recordings of the birds too. So even if we can't see them, mm -hmm. we can hear them. And I've tried to mimic some of their calls like the <laughs> EV and things. And before I lost my voice, I thought I got okay. <laughs> but, you know, just being able to like have those calls as familiar to us so that when, you know, you do go out into the forest, you can be like, I know what that bird is. Um, I do that to my family and stuff now. And they're like, we know Luca, we know that that's an Amaki. <laughs> I'm like, okay, just making sure. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned those resources. Mm -hmm. Those are definitely good places to go. Yeah, and then um, as we kind of wrap up, is there any final ways that you think of, oh, in addition to, um, is there anything that we can do to control mosquitoes? You know, down here, you know, the um, Birds Not Mosquito Partnership is working to protect the birds in their like critical habitats. And that's majority of the time away far from our home, but is there anything we can do at home to help out? Yeah, for sure. Um, so of course, like the mosquitoes that are down where we are probably uh, lead to the mosquitoes that are higher up in elevation where the birds are. Um, so uh, controlling mosquitoes where we're at um, in the lowlands is super important. Um, it also is important for our health and our pets' health. Um, but things that you can do, uh, it's super easy. You just go outside and look for buckets or, you know, for me, I have a lot of like planting pots <laughs> <laughs> that like tend to collect water. And I have to remind myself, you gotta go like turn them over and make sure um, those aren't creating uh, habitats for mosquitoes to lay their eggs in. Um, so there's that. Um, it's really stuff around your house that might be collecting water. It's also um, being sure not to litter mm -hmm. um, because that trash can uh, serve as a, a place for water to collect as well where mosquitoes can breed. Um, even better than not littering is like picking up litter when you see it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> be anti-littering, I yeah. don't know. Um, but yeah, those are great things. Um, another fun one is to do your best to create bird habitat in okay. the lowlands. Um, our, uh, our lowland forests are almost non-existent, unfortunately, because mm -hmm. of course that's where most of us live now. Um, but there are places where we can start to plant native trees and native shrubs and um, try to recreate and reforest um, these places around us so that um, hopefully our birds will come back. And, yeah. What are the top three plants that someone can put into the ground that you think would be beneficial for the birds once they're able to come back <laughs> down to the lowlands? Yeah, so honey creepers uh, in general, the, the mo one of the most popular or um, preferred foods is the nectar of the ohia lehua blossom. Okay. So um, planting ohia, it, it's a little bit of a slow grower, so it's good to start <laughs> like today. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. Um, they're also, ohi are also uh, threatened by rapid ohi death. And so the more trees that we can plant, um, the more chances that we have of them surviving and creating a nice healthy forest. Um, there's a lot of other different 
uh, plants that you could choose. I, I really love ferns, so there's like hapu'u and palapalai, and um, those are great ground covers. If you live in a drier area, um, mm -hmm. there's uh, like pau'u, hi'iaka, and those are kind of like, I don't know if they're really forest plants, but um, they're plants, they're native plants that um, provide ground cover and kind of take up space so that invasives don't do that. <laughs> and so that your backyard doesn't become a breeding ground for like invasives to then go back out into the yeah. wild parts and stuff. I guess for, I guess like forest wise, Ali'i is also a really great mm -hmm. um, plant. It sprouts super easy and um, yeah, it's just a lovely plant. <laughs> I, I love it. It's the Chinese lantern um, uh, seed pods. I love the color ranges that they come through from like dark red all the way to light pink and things. Um, and then just real quick, um, so I know that mosquitoes can breed in like a little bit of water from like a couple centimeters. So even like if it's not a big tub of water, even just like a lid or something, it's good to flip over. Um, is there any final things that you would like for you know the community to know in a way that they can help support just conservation in general here in Hawaii? Yeah, so um, I think as a, First of all, I would just say, um, you know, like eh, trying to educate yourself is really amazing. Getting out there, doing malama aina work uh, with, if not in your backyard, doing it with organizations. The great thing is that it feels like there's a lot of organizations doing that now. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that's sort of uh, more recent, I guess within the past couple of years, is the green fee. Um, and so the group that's been putting that together um, is pushing in 2023 um, legislation that would um, require the collection of a um, an additional fee to non-resident visitors to Hawaii. And the idea is that fee is green because the money would be used to um, fund environmental restoration work in Hawaii um, so that, you know, the place where we live, it, it continues to be um, Bonneful continues to be um, a place where we thrive and hopefully um, even more so there's more restoration and um, all of that. So then in Mauna Loa we can start having, you know, our dry forests back, our natural um, native wetland forests back, and then, you know, even extending out to the work that we do at Keavava Wetland and, you know, helping out the Alaiula and our other endangered species. So that's really exciting to hear that you know, money's a thing <laughs> that we need to do conservation. So another way to help fund all the different wonderful projects is great. And so thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. And then we'll um, put that up again. But I want to say thank you so much for coming. And we enjoyed having you here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This is great. Okay. Mahalo. Sorry, I didn't check the time. Mm -hmm.